recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Thank you very much. And on the behalf of the National Cancer Institute, I wish to welcome everyone to the December Advanced Topics in Implementation Science webinar. Today, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Lawrence Polinkis from the University of Southern California School of Social Work, who will be joined by our very own David Chambers, who will moderate the session. A very brief word about logistics, and we'll be off. We ask that if you are not already on mute, to please keep your phone on mute for the duration of today's presentation. As mentioned, the session is being recorded, and muting all lines will help us to avoid any background noise. We encourage questions. They can be submitted by using the Q&A feature on the right-hand side of your screen. Please type your question in the provided Q&A field and hit Submit. Feel free to submit your question at any time, but we'll be opening the session for questions when the presentation is finished. Without any further ado, it's my pleasure to turn the meeting over to Dr. David Chambers. Thank you, Sarah, as always, for getting us going. Uh, I am very uh, happy to uh, also welcome everyone uh, who is able to join in. Uh, this is uh, one of a series of presentations that we've had under the, under the sort of rubric of our advanced topics in implementation science that are trying to delve further into some of the complexities, the challenges, but also the opportunities associated with different uh, research methods, measures, and models. And so uh, we're very, very fortunate to have Larry Polinkis uh, joining us and, and sharing his expertise around mixed methods. Uh, I believe the first time that I had met Larry was in San Diego. There was a, uh, when I was over at the National Institute of Mental Health, there was an RFA that was helping to establish these research networks uh, to try and foster uh, research around child and adolescent uh, mental health uh, interventions and implementation. And I think that was the linkage where there, uh, there was a center with it at UCSD uh, that was uh, brainstorming better ways to improve mental health services and really think about the implementation research that would do that. And they reached out and brought in Larry Polinkis, who had incredible expertise as an anthropologist, wasn't, I think, at that point as much focused on mental health and specifically child mental health issues. Larry, you can correct me if I'm misremembering. But I think from that meeting and those sets of discussions, uh, the mental health field definitely found a champion and found an expert to really think through a whole range of different qualitative methods, how they can integrate nicely with quantitative methods, and really strengthen the implementation science uh, that, that is being done. And I think Larry's influence has not just been uh, specifically within the mental health world, but we all, uh, across different disease topics, health issues, uh, we've looked to Larry to, to really provide that leadership around the best way to try and integrate these different methods. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I want to turn things over to, to, to Larry, who, as you can see here, uh, is the Professor of Social Policy and Health uh, and the Chair of the Department of Children, uh, Youth, and Families at USC School of Social Work. Uh, uh, Larry will take us through, and then we encourage, certainly if questions come up as, uh, as the uh, presentation is going on, you can type them in the in the chat box, but we'd love to have questions and discussion following uh, Larry's presentation. So, so, Larry, you want to take it away? Thank you very much, David. I hope you uh, can all hear me fine. And uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, uh, it's true that we first met just as I was being introduced to the field of uh, mental health services and child welfare. Uh, and uh, it's been a very rewarding experience. Uh, it's also provided me with an opportunity to uh, bring the, the training that I've had as an anthropologist uh, in qualitative methods with the training that I received as an epidemiologist in quantitative methods. And I, I think, uh, you know, in all the, in the areas of research that's funded through NIH, uh, it's perhaps in the area related to dissemination implementation that um, those opportunities have uh, perhaps produced uh, the greatest amount of uh, benefits uh, and, and perhaps the greatest need as well. Uh, as you know, implementation science is, is founded upon <laughs> a, a number of pillars, one of which is the conceptual models and frameworks that, that investigators have been developing, the strategies for facilitating implementation and sustainment, but also the methodological innovations uh, that have been used to better understand the process of implementation uh, and, and to facilitate that process as well. 
And it's uh, perhaps the, the role that mixed methods play in that methodological innovation that has been most intriguing to me, and I think uh, uh, offers a great potential for the field as a whole. So um, let's see if I can um, start off here. Uh, what I plan to do today is talk about research in uh, that I've been working on three interrelated facets of the implementation of evidence-based practices. And those three have to do with the role that uh, social networks of providers play in implementation, uh, the extent to which the use of research evidence uh, influences the process of implementation, and then finally the importance of the interactions and relationships between researchers and practitioners and the kinds of uh, cultural exchanges and changes within their respective organizational cultures that occur as a result of that interaction. Uh, I'm going to focus specifically on public youth serving systems, uh, child welfare, uh, especially child mental health and juvenile justice, and then I'm going to illustrate some of the principles of mixed method designs uh, in implementation uh, research through some of the work that I've been doing in those settings. So to begin with, what are mixed methods? And oftentimes the term gets confused with um, uh, mixed models uh, that are used uh, primarily in quantitative analyses, but mixed methods really is, represent a, a methodology or way of collecting, analyzing, and mixing, the emphasis being on the mixing of both quantitative and qualitative data in a single study or, or a series of studies. And the idea being that, uh, and the reason why it's been promoted, uh, particularly by NIH, is the notion that using quantitative and qualitative approaches together provides a much more comprehensive understanding of research problems than using either approach independently. And so uh, there has been increased emphasis on the use of mixed methods in health services, mental health services, and in implementation research. Mixed method designs combine quantitative and qualitative approaches, uh, and that can occur either in a single study or in multi-phase studies uh, where you've got uh, a number of uh, conjoint studies or studies that are connected uh, together uh, trying to address a common problem. And the thing that I want to emphasize is that it's not merely parallel play where you uh, recruit a qualitative expert and have them conduct a qualitative study um, with very little interaction with the quantitative experts who are uh, conducting a, a separate study or a related study on the same topic, but with very little interaction. Uh, it's really the interaction that is the heart and soul of mixed methods. So you could also see it as a model of and a model for interdisciplinary research, not only with respect to uh, expertise and methods, but with respect to expertise and content as well. The intent of mixed method designs uh, often is to answer confirmatory and exploratory questions within the same study. And by that I mean many times we use the qualitative methods to explore an issue or a concept, develop hypotheses, develop a conceptual framework, and then use the quantitative methods uh, to confirm those hypotheses or to validate the model. There are a number of ways that mixed method studies are conducted, and uh, the, the field itself has developed its own nomenclature, its own jargon over time. Um, the, three of the, the primary elements of a design uh, relate to the timing of data collection, the weight or priority assigned to each method, and then the function uh, of the design itself. So with respect to the timing, the qualitative and the quantitative uh, can either be done simultaneously uh, in the course of a study or it could be done sequentially. Uh, sequentially in the sense that one method precedes the other, one method uh, follows the other. Um, and 
the nature of the timing will often depend on uh, practical considerations, uh, the logistics of, of doing a study in a particular setting, but it also may have to do with uh, the functions that uh, each method fulfills in the overall project. Similarly, uh, the weight or priority that we assign to each method uh, can dictate uh, how much effort is devoted to conducting qualitative uh, uh, data collection and analysis and uh, quantitative data collection and analysis. So that, for example, if the uh, intent really is to uh, explore uh, an issue or develop a conceptual model, uh, to use an inductive approach, uh, then uh, priority is given to the qualitative method. If the intent is more deductive in nature, in which you're testing a hypothesis, uh, you're looking for additional understanding and expl explanation of the results, then one might give priority to the quantitative methods. But there are studies in which one might give equal priority to both sets of methods. So you notice on this chart, you'll see qual and quan, which are the, uh, the, the sh uh, short uh, convenient terms used for qualitative and quantitative. But whether it's lowercase or uppercase may indicate the priority that one assigns to it over the course of a mixed method study. Now, in terms of the function of mixed methods, there are a number of ways that, uh, and a number of typologies that uh, the experts in the field have developed as a way of explaining why you do mixed methods. And I'm not going to uh, go line by line on this particular chart, other than to say that in looking at how mixed methods have been used in implementation research in the past, We've identified five major design types, the first being convergence, where uh, many times uh, it, uh, it's often referred to as triangulation, when you're trying to validate one data set with another. So it may be that you've identified some concepts or themes with qualitative data and you want to validate it with quantitative data. Or many times we uh, quantify the qualitative data and translate uh, many of the, the topics and, and themes that we identify in interviews and focus groups, for example, uh, into uh, quantifiable concepts and analyze the data that way. Um, but the idea basically is to corroborate the findings from one set of data with that of another set of data or, or bring them together. Complementarity really refers to uh, how one uh, it conducts qualitative and quantitative analyses in ways that address uh, different questions, but questions that are related to one another. So that, for example, you may use the qualitative methods to answer exploratory questions, while you may use the quantitative measures to answer confirmatory um, questions. Or qualitative measures can be used to uh, really drill down into a concept, uh, whereas the quantitative methods can be used to generalize those findings uh, and, and determine how broad those findings happen to be. Expansion really refers to a, a way of using one set of methods to explain the findings of the other set. So many times you might get a result from a quantitative analysis that's completely unexpected. And uh, not being able to find the answer in the quantitative data itself, you might use a qualitative study or conduct interviews with study participants as a way of better understanding uh, those quantitative findings. And the reverse can occur as well, using quantitative data to help understand or explain qualitative findings. Exploratory development, uh, oftentimes qualitative methods are used to develop a questionnaire to figure out what's the right way of asking a question, or to develop a conceptual framework uh, or model, uh, and then use the quantitative methods to test that model. 
Uh, sampling oftentimes is used as a way of identifying uh, the participants for either a quantitative or a qualitative study so that in order to determine, for example, the, the best suited participants for a randomized controlled trial, one might use qualitative methods of uh, interviewing, participant observation to figure out who the ideal participants in a potential population or pool of participants would likely be. Or the obverse might be that on the basis of, uh, for instance, attitudes towards evidence-based practices and the way that they uh, score on a standardized measure, uh, selecting people who score in the highest uh, uh, range of that and score in the lowest uh, part of that range uh, for a qualitative investigation to uh, capture in greater depth the uh, kinds of issues related to attitudes uh, would be an example of the use of both methods within the same study. So how do you decide when to use uh, any uh, of these particular strategies for uh, collecting and analyzing data? Well. When you're seeking answers to the same question, then you try to use convergence as a way of uh, bringing them together. Um, when you're seeking answers to related questions, then complementarity uh, would be the, the function or the purpose of the mixed method design. When the findings that are based on one method raises questions that can be answered only by use of the other methods, that would be an example of expansion. Uh, when the findings based on a method are prerequisite to the use of another method, such as developing a questionnaire or conceptual model, um, then development is the, the function or the design. And then when you use one method to help identify or uh, define participant example for collecting and analyzing data using the other method. That's an example of sampling. So uh, and finally, in terms of uh, how the two types of methods relate to one another, there are three ways that methods uh, can be mixed. Uh, one is by merging the data, and that, that would be an illustration of convergence, for example, where the quantitative and the qualitative data are merged to define or develop the results. Connecting the data is often uh, used in development uh, or sampling, where you, you connect the qualitative to the quantitative and then generate the results. Uh, in implementation research, however, one of the most common designs that, that one happens to see is embedding the data, especially when uh, we're talking about hybrid designs where we've got uh, effectiveness trials and implementation studies being conducted simultaneously. So that one can imagine conducting or collecting qualitative data in the context of a larger randomized controlled trial and generating the results that way. So when uh, you're seeking answers to the same question, you're essentially merging the data. When you're connecting, when you're seeking answers to related questions sequentially, you're connecting the data. And then when you're uh, seeking answers to related questions simultaneously, uh, you're embedding the data. So these are kind of rules of thumb or, or principles that um, people who engage in mixed methods uh, often use to decide uh, how to bring the two types of methods together uh, for a particular purpose. Now as it pertains to implementation research, uh, as I said, many times we use the quantitative measures to measure an intervention and or the implementation outcomes, and then the qualitative measures to measure the process um, by which um, that intervention uh, plays out or the implementation uh, does or does not occur. Um, we could use qualitative methods to explore implementation steps and then generate a conceptual model along with testable hypotheses or the quantitative methods to confirm the validity of that model by testing those hypotheses. Um, the quantitative methods can be used to examine content and the qualitative methods to examine context 
which oftentimes occurred, and knowing how important context plays in uh, understanding implementation and facilitating it. Or many times we use the qualitative methods to incorporate the perspectives of our study participants, whereas the quantitative methods really reflect the mindset and the understanding and worldview of the, the researchers themselves. And then finally, given the fact that one of the biggest challenges we face in implementation research is um, constraints on sample size, because many times our unit of analyses is not individual uh, clients or patients or uh, uh, agencies or clinics, but rather systems of care, that many times we can use both sets of methods to um, uh, help confirm the uh, quantitative findings, even though we're, we're constrained by power or, or likewise uh, to validate uh, conclusions drawn from qualitative analyses uh, with limited non-representative data. So the examples of mixed methods that I'm going to spend uh, the rest of my time talking about relate to three particular studies that I've been involved with over the years. Uh, one having to do with social networks and the implementation of evidence-based practices in which we use a design that reflect um, uh, embedded, um, a uh, implementation and qualitative study embedded in a larger quantitative randomized controlled trial, merging the data uh, and connecting it to test hypotheses, uh, giving equal emphasis to qualitative and quantitative for the, the purpose of convergence, complementarity, and development. Uh, the second study relates to um, also within the same project, innovation and the use of research evidence, where we're also looking at collecting qualitative data that's embedded in a larger randomized controlled trial, uh, connecting the qualitative and the quantitative to uh, test hypotheses, uh, there, too, focusing on complementarity and development. Uh, and then the third study related to uh, conducting a qualitative uh, assessment of the implementation of uh, various forms of evidence-based practices in a standard and modular format uh, in which the qualitative study was embedded in a larger randomized controlled trial uh, as sort of a, a secondary objective of the larger project, but also using that data to help explain the quantitative findings of the RCT um, and using it to develop a conceptual model or framework of implementation uh, itself and the role that exchanges between researchers and practitioners play in that. So the first study uh, I, I did with my colleague uh, Patty Chamberlain at the Oregon Social Learning Center and focused on social networks and implementation. Um, the, the intent of this project was really to look at the role that the interpersonal contacts within agencies and between agencies that have a common purpose, in this case the purpose being to provide services uh, to at-risk youth. Uh, plays in the adoption of innovative practices. We know from the literature on social network theory that uh, many times these networks provide important ways of uh, diffusing uh, uh, innovations, diffusing uh, new practices uh, throughout a uh, population uh, and throughout organizations as well. So this study was done in the context of a larger randomized control trial of a implementation strategy known as community development teams. Uh, and the intent was to see if they were more effective in scaling up the use of an evidence-based practice than the, the typical pattern of agencies coming to a treatment developer, getting training and some technical assistance, uh, but doing it fairly independently. Uh, the evidence-based practice in this case was multidimensional treatment and foster care, which uh, is really designed for youth who would otherwise be in congregate care, but they're placed in well-supported foster homes. And the community development teams were really a way of, uh, almost like a learning collaborative, bringing together key stakeholders, uh, 
in this case from different agencies in different counties we're trying to problem solve um, the, the challenge of how to scale up an evidence-based practice, uh, given the financial constraints, given the, the lack of skilled staff and training and so forth. Um, and then uh, this was done in the context of an adaptive or rolling randomized controlled trial, where we randomized 40 counties in California and 11 in Ohio into two conditions. Uh, services as usual versus the community development team. Uh, we looked, we stratified them into cohorts so we didn't have to train everybody all at once, uh, but had a wait list feature so that counties that weren't ready to, to begin the process could wait to join a later cohort, or those that were very eager and willing could uh, join an earlier cohort. The aims of the uh, uh, in, implementation study or the qualitative study was to describe the structure and function of the influence networks, uh, determine the influence these networks had in decisions relating to participating in the, uh, the overall RCT, and then to identify personal and contextual factors that influence the operation uh, of these networks. So what we did was begin by conducting semi-structured interviews with 38 agency directors, senior administrators from counties that were part of the first cohort of this larger randomized control trial. Uh, we then asked them to participate in a web-based survey of social network structure. So uh, those who were interviewed were then asked if they could complete a survey asking them to identify as many as 10 people with whom they relied on for advice on whether or not to use evidence-based practices in order to meet the mental health needs of the, the youth that they serve. And then uh, we uh, looked at uh, the degree to which they were scaling up the use of MTFC by using measure developed by Patty Chamberlain and Lisa Saldana um, called the stage of implementation completion uh, scale. And that enabled us to measure progress made in implementing and engaging in sustainability. So the, the sixth scale, as it's known, uh, assesses uh, engagement and activities in eight specific stages, beginning with engagement, that first contact, to competency or certification, uh, which approximates the sustainment or sustainability of an intervention. Examples of the sick items include consideration of feasibility, for example, in stage two, where you look at the date of first contact. Uh, the date the first in-person meeting was held, or the date that the feasibility. So this enables us not only to check off whether these activities were done, but to assess how long it took in order to complete these activities. Uh, in looking at the social networks, now the reason why we call this a mixed method study is you'll notice a big uh, diagram or figure on the left here which indicates all of the participants in the study uh, as well as all of those that they identified that they interact with. So essentially, out of the 30 people who completed the questionnaire, we uh, plus the information from the qualitative interviews of those 30 people and the additional nine people who were interviewed but didn't complete the questionnaire, we identified a network of 176 individuals, and we were able to identify the extent to which those 176 individuals uh, were engaged in activities uh, at a particular level of um, implementation. So um, either early on in the process, the pre-implementation stage, uh, the continuation through stages four through six, which is highlighted by um, uh, dark green, and then finally uh, the final stages of implementation, which is highlighted by the bright green. And as you can see, there are, you know, there's one very large um, uh, uh, network, and then there are a number of relatively small networks. And it turns out that the smaller networks 
were less engaged uh, or had proceeded not nearly as quickly in the process of implementation as participants in the one large network. And when we look at the characteristics of the network themselves as predictors of stage of implementation, we found that uh, being in a large county, uh, being in an urban county were significant independent predictors of implementation, but also the extent to which uh, individuals were a source of information and advice uh, was a significant predictor as well. And that makes sense given the fact that oftentimes uh, if you're an early adopter, other people come to you looking for information on how you did it. And so one would predict, uh, one would understand why those kinds of people happen to be further along in that process than those people who are not. We also looked at the extent to which the community development teams, which were really intended to foster bringing people together uh, and developing networks, were successful in doing so. So on this chart, you'll see the network as identified participating in the community development team versus the networks uh, in the control condition. And there's one big network uh, associated with the community development team there's one relatively large network in the control condition and then four very small networks. And we found in the analyses of the uh, structural network measures, the quantitative measures, that in fact there was a significant difference in uh, the two conditions. So that essentially the community development team approach really achieved its goal of bringing people together as illustrated by uh, the network characteristics. In addition to uh, the quantitative analyses of the social network data, we also collected information uh, related to uh, the, the interactions that occur from the qualitative interviews as well. And what we learned from that is that typically the leaders of the child welfare, uh, juvenile justice, mental health systems develop and maintain these networks based on their roles as systems leaders or as associate directors, what their responsibilities are, uh, the, the proximity that they may have either being within the same county or in adjacent counties, but oftentimes based on friendship ties that had nothing to do with their job responsibility, but the fact that they grew up together and uh, lived in the same community. Uh, we found that social networking uh, is central to the implementation of uh, evidence-based practices through uh, two mechanisms, one having to do with uh, acquiring information and advice related to evidence-based practices, but also pooling resources um, among agencies. And both of those mechanisms involve collaboration between organizations. So based on that qualitative data, we were able to develop a conceptual model of functioning specifically on the inner organizational characteristics of um, that kind of collaboration with variables or themes that related to the outer context like availability of fund, government mandates, uh, characteristics of the inner context like the uh, organizational cultures of the in individual agencies, but the culture of the collaboration itself. Uh, characteristics of the collaboration, like whether it was based on a formal uh, memorandum of uh, agreement, uh, uh, the intent of the collaboration, that in turn had a, an impact on the characteristics of the social network, which in turn influenced the uh, stage of implementation. So based on that, we learned that successful implementation uh, requires considering and utilizing uh, existing social networks uh, as well as the sharing of information and resources. Related to this, 
uh, social network study was a focus specifically on uh, innovation and the use of research evidence. And the intent really was to understand better when, uh, where, how, and under what conditions research evidence supporting evidence-based practices or supporting uh, a particular strategy for implementation is actually used and how that use can be improved. Uh, so we really wanted to understand how policymakers gained access to evaluated and applied research evidence in their decisions whether or not to implement. This particular study had two aims, understanding and measuring the use of research evidence, uh, and then prospectively determining whether that use uh, predicted stage of evidence-based practice implementation. As with the first study, we began by conducting semi-structured interviews and focus groups where we asked systems leaders, you know, what constitutes an evidence-based practice? Where do they get the information about them? How do they evaluate the quality, the validity, reliability, the relevance of that information? And then how do they apply it in making decisions about whether or not to adopt new practices? We use that information as the basis of developing two new quantitative measures, one being the structured interview for evidence use, or the SIEU, and the second being the cultural exchange inventory that assess the extent to which um, uh, participants in this process uh, not only interacted with one another, but uh, were impacted by that interaction. We then conducted a web-based survey of uh, a number of leaders participating in the larger CALO study, uh, as well as uh, 10 leaders who were uh, implementing uh, MTFC in other studies uh, in other states, and then uh, 37 participants in a related study uh, having to do with implementation of policies and procedures, best practices on psychotropic medication use in child welfare. The SIEU identified three major constructs, uh, where information is acquired or input, how it's evaluated or processed, and how it then is applied or output. And as you can see from this chart, a number of subscales uh, so that information is often acquired from other members of one's personal networks or from outside experts, or oftentimes through uh, Google searches or searches of documents and published materials. Uh, systems leaders assess uh, evidence on the basis of their own concepts of validity and reliability, but more importantly on whether it's relevant to the communities that they serve or the populations they treat. Uh, and then somewhat to the extent that they rely on other people that they trust to provide an assessment for them. And then with respect to the output, uh, many times uh, they will use the evidence to make or support decisions, but there also may be instances where the evidence is ignored simply because uh, even um, in the, uh, with the availability of the evidence, uh, there's simply no capacity to implement uh, the program or project or intervention that the evidence supports. So we then um, uh, interviewed or uh, did a web-based survey of 140 directors participating in the larger CALO study. Um, and collected information, again, using the stage of implementation completion checklist, looking at the most advanced stage achieved in a specific year, how long it took them to achieve a stage, and then the proportion of activities completed within each stage, and then uh, assess the extent to which the um, measures of the structured interview of evidence use, input, process, output measures, predicted stage of implementation. And what we found was the significant association between accessing information and applying information and the stage. So the more they accessed information, the more engaged they were in applying it, the further they proceeded. Um, with total engagement in evidence use, there was also a significant independent correlation. 
When we looked at the proportion of activities completed in each of the three phases of the stages of implementation, we found a significant association between acquiring evidence uh, and the, the second and third stage and the uh, total engagement in evidence use in the second and third stages as well. What we learned from the qualitative data, however, is that there are additional uh, types of evidence that people rely on in making decisions. So the evidence of the resources necessary and available for making use of research evidence or the supply available uh, necessary to uh, engage in evidence use was a consideration. Uh, evidence of the need to use research evidence uh, or the demand for that evidence. And then finally, um, personalized evidence based on experience, which could have been personal clinical experience, oftentimes was based on experience gained by <coughs> going to another county or another agency to see for themselves how it operated and whether or not it was successful. So what we learned from that study was that engagement in the use of research evidence is positively associated with stage of implementation, particularly in the later phases and stages, but that one has to understand that use of research evidence within the context of the resources available to implement, the demand for innovation, and the experience of the policymaker or practitioner. Finally, the third study, uh, as I said, took place in the context of a larger effectiveness trial of evidence-based practices. And this was funded through the MacArthur Foundation. John Weiss at Harvard was the principal investigator. And then I was put in charge of looking at the dissemination implementation aspects of this trial. The intent of the overall study was to compare the effectiveness of three approaches to treating depression, anxiety, and conduct disorders in 8- to 13-year-olds, one being usual clinical care, one being a standard uh, approach to uh, applying a manual for an evidence-based practice and following that manual from the first to the last chapter. And the third was more of a modular approach. Uh, in other words, making decisions about which aspects of the EBP was really appropriate to that particular client or patient. In this particular case, the modular approach was looked at uh, because of the, the practicality of the issues involved in treating clients in these settings. The fact that comorbidity is common and that one doesn't simply treat depression or simply treat anxiety, but clients oftentimes present with both. Children don't always stay put. Uh, the problems may shift during episodes of care. Um, but most importantly, the, the modular approach mirrors what clinicians actually do with evidence-based practices and how they adapt them for routine use. So the randomized control trial found that of the three conditions, the most effective was the modular approach. In fact, it was found to be much more effective than the standard approach, and there really wasn't a whole lot of difference between the standardized approach and uh, treatment as usual. And the, the researchers were a little puzzled as to why that was the case. So in order to investigate that, we intended to conduct a process and implementation evaluation of both uh, treatment conditions uh, within the, the larger project, uh, and then look at the characteristics of the clinics that either facilitated or impeded the dissemination and implementation of the practices themselves. So this uh, was a qualitative study embedded in a larger randomized control trial that was quantitative in nature, focused on effectiveness outcomes, whereas we were more interested in looking at implementation process using the qualitative data. So we engaged in participant observation at the training sessions, conducted key informant interviews, um, and then towards the end of the study, we conducted semi-structured interviews with clinicians uh, and did member checking or validating what we were learning from those interviews by conducting focus groups with therapists and clinical supervisors. 
This, and I'm not going to go into detail on, on each of these boxes, but provides you with an example of the function of development in mixed methods. So on the basis of the qualitative data that we collected, we identified a process of implementation beginning with pre-implementation de uh, determinants like training opportunities, uh, level of engagement in the clinical trial, and the fit between the treatment and the clinician, uh, characteristics of short-term implementation that included interactions between uh, researchers and, and clinicians, as well as the extent to which they acquired competence in the intervention, uh, and their first impressions about whether they thought it worked or didn't work. Characteristics of long-term implementation, including technical, continued technical support, uh, agency leadership, and then finally, sustainability. And what we found from this is that three months after the, the trial ended, 93% of the therapists continued to use the evidence-based practices in some form. Um, and they came to accept it after using them, after they tried it, they liked it. They valued the interactions and support they got from researchers. They valued the structure of the treatments themselves and the evidence base of the treatments. But interestingly, 93% of the therapists who continued to use them, used them in a modular fashion. Even if they were uh, trained in the, the structured approach or the standard manualized approach, they began to use them in a modular fashion. Well, among the reasons why uh, they use them in a modular fashion is that we found from both the therapists and the researchers that allowed for more of an interaction or exchange between the, the two groups participating in the study. Uh, the therapists loved the association that they had with the, um, uh, the researchers. They thought that was a major benefit of participating in the study. Everybody loved the training and the supervision. Um, but they also thought that the modular approach allowed for more accommodation and negotiation. So if, uh, if the therapist wanted to make adjustments, they would uh, uh, check it out with the supervisors, vet it with the supervisors, and get validation. That, in turn, enabled refinements to the modular approach itself. So in a sense, what this helped us to do was uh, uh, tailor a, a theory that we had been working on related to the exchanges that occur between representatives of different organizational cultures. In this instance, those cultures being um, uh, uh, researchers and clinicians. Uh, cultural exchange can be looked at as both a theory and a method to facilitate these interactions. But it focuses not just on uh, knowledge exchange or, or knowledge uh, attitudes and practices, but a transformation in the belief systems that govern uh, both knowledge and the application of that knowledge. And it's a process that, uh, you know, reflects debate and compromise, the kinds of interactions that occurred between clinicians and practitioners in this study. So based on that work, we've looked at, you know, using mixed methods as a way of developing a comprehensive understanding of implementation by linking process and outcomes, by linking both of those to context, by identifying new strategies to support uh, implementation, say, through the design and manipulation of social networks or the use of research evidence or the facilitation of cultural exchanges, but also by advancing the methodology of mixed methods, whereby we might use qualitative methods to identify and implement innovative quantitative designs, but also looking to um, develop innovative qualitative methods as well. So I'll leave it at that, and I, I think we have a little bit of time for questions, if, if there are any. We do, and let me just jump in. Larry, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. We are going to go ahead and open it up to questions. As a reminder, questions can be submitted using the Q&A feature on the right-hand side of your screen. Just type your questions in the provided field and hit submit. Great. Yeah, so, so absolutely. Uh, while we're waiting for, for people to, uh, to, to type in their questions, I just wanted to start, what kind of advice you have for 
uh, investigators, particularly those who may not specifically be, uh, you know, feel like they have that mixed methods expertise, uh, is, are any advice in terms of how one tries to construct the appropriate uh, team? Well, in my experience had been uh, the, you know, uh, the fact that uh, people who uh, were engaged in implementation research but had been uh, predominantly quantitatively trained had reached out to me for my expertise in qualitative methods. And um, that, that seems to be the common uh, experience. Uh, unless you're somebody like myself who is trained in both quantitative and qualitative, uh, it, it's really hard to expect that any single individual is going to be equally proficient in either of those two sets of methods. But certainly, mm -hmm. uh, and as I said, you know, in, in a way this provides a model of and a model for interdisciplinary collaboration. Uh, it provides a way of bringing together people with different sets of expertise. So uh, more often than not, uh, it's the experience of quantitative me uh, methodologists who reach out to qualitative experts. But um, it's also incumbent upon the qualitative experts to know something about quantitative methods because many times um, there's been a disconnect between uh, even the, the concepts of scientific rigor and the scientific method that may occur between people who are trained in one set of methods versus another that uh, oftentimes leads to difficulties in the ability to communicate with one another. So mm -hmm. it's not just a matter of reaching out to somebody with a particular expertise, but, but somebody who at least has the capacity for communicating uh, as well as collaborating with people who have been trained in a different set of methods. Uh -huh. Thanks for that. So I see within uh, the, the Q&A box we have a question from uh, Deb Bowen about Good citations for some of the descriptive labels you used in the early portion of the talk, more reading. And I do see that beyond that, we have a post from Wynn Norton specifically of the resources associated with the mixed methods training program for the health sciences that Hopkins does. Um, do you have other suggestions of, of uh, places where people should go to, to get more uh, of, the, of the basic um, information on mixed methods? Well, uh, the, the Hopkins program is a, a, an excellent resource. Uh, there have also been, you know, uh, several of us who have given uh, mixed method uh, workshops or, or training. Uh, I know Allison Hamilton, for example, who's based at the VA in Los Angeles, uh, has done a number of these, uh, you know, uh, pre-conference workshops uh, at a number of different conferences, and many times it's very helpful to look at that. Uh, you know, I, I've taught a course in mixed method uh, uh, designs and research trying to, you know, condense 16 weeks uh, of what I would teach doctoral students into one day of activities. Uh, those mm -hmm. kinds of opportunities occur, certainly in terms of textbooks. Uh, the Cresswell and Plano Clark book is probably one of the more widely used texts. Uh, I've published a, a number of papers that, that outline the typology of mixed method designs, specifically in implementation research. Um, and uh, there's another book by Janet Morse on uh, mixed methods uh, that's also a very useful text as well. Great, thanks for that. And, and what we can do, Sarah and I were just uh, comparing notes, is we can on, on the Research to Reality site, uh, we can post those, those uh, resources and if there are any others that come to mind, we can definitely add that so that anyone who wants to follow up on the discussion will, will have access to those. Um, so, so thanks for that. Um, sure. so, one other, uh, as I'm, I'm just looking, I don't think, uh, oh, yeah, so it says please make the Hopkins resource link visible to all participants. And so to everyone in the chat and everyone in the Q&A, we will go ahead and be posting the links, as mentioned, on both the IS website and on the archive page at researchtoreality.cancer.gov. Right, yes. So we're getting some of the further detail on that, and we'll just make that available to everybody. 
Um, I was wondering, Larry, to what degree when you're seeing various studies that are involving mixed methods, the degree to which there's good integration of those different methods? Often I know uh, we've seen where someone, it almost seems like they've tacked on a particular qualitative component without it being as well integrated. Any, any suggestions for people who are, who are really wanting to think about how is it not just sort of two separate studies that seem to be coexisting, but really well integrated? Right. So um, I, I think uh, perhaps one of the more common things uh, or trends that, that you see in research projects and research proposals is that um, many times uh, people will use qualitative methods like interviews and focus groups uh, to evaluate or, or to collect some uh, pilot data or baseline data on feasibility and acceptability of an implementation strategy, for example, um, and then uh, collect um, uh, the quantitative data looking at the effectiveness of, of the strategy itself. Uh, and, and so each of those has their particular function. Uh, but where the, the, uh, the missing piece to that is, is a clarification or explanation of how those two functions relate to one another. So in other words, you know, um, uh, feasibility and acceptability can have a major impact on whether the strategy works or not, uh, obviously. And, but uh, simply saying, well, I've answered the questions about feasibility and acceptability using these methods, and now I'm going to use uh, quantitative methods to answer this question without really explaining how the two questions are connected to one another and how the data from the two methods uh, illustrate those connections, uh, I think is a, a piece that many times investigators uh, could benefit by paying a little bit more attention to. Uh, similarly, uh, there's often the assumption that uh, any data can be quantified, uh, you know, even a data that's collected through semi-structured interviews. But one ha also has to keep in mind that any quantify quantification of that data and, and use of statistics to analyze that data have to meet certain assumptions. Uh, and in the failure to do so, you may have some numbers, but being able to interpret what those numbers really mean uh, and signify and whether the conclusions based on those numbers are valid conclusions uh, requires that the assumptions underlying uh, the quantification of qualitative data uh, continue, nevertheless continue to adhere to the expectations and assumptions that underlie the use of, say, parametric or non-parametric statistics. So it's those kinds of things that uh, people need to keep in mind when putting together grant proposals. Uh, nowadays, it's not just a matter of saying we're doing a mixed method design, but explaining within the application why it's mixed method and not simply two parallel methods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so with that, Larry, I'm going to go ahead and say thank you so much for that wonderful presentation and your time during the Q&A, and also a quick thank you to David for all of his help today. Um, just a few last moment thoughts. Your feedback is important to us, and we encourage you to complete our online evaluation, a link to which will be sent to you shortly via email. As mentioned, we'd like to continue this discussion online at researchtreality.cancer.gov, where you can engage with speakers and other participants through forum posts and discussion, as well as find other links to resources that we mentioned. And for those of you who registered for the canceled November session featuring Doug Luke, we will be hearing from him next month in January. So do please, please keep an eye out for that registration. Thank you again for joining us for this month, and you may disconnect at this time. Thanks, all.